Right. You think an idea has to be revolutionary in order to be worth spreading? I don't think so. I think we need little gentle reminders of those ideas that are important but not perhaps unique. I think we need these little seeds of thought spreading over and over again by different people and packaged in different stories. Here is an idea which is not unique but I think quite important and it's packaged in my story. Perhaps you remember a book that was published last year uh, by an Australian woman who was working in palliative care. She had been talking to a lot of people who were facing death about what they regretted most in their lives. Do you remember that book? I think some of you have heard about it. It's called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying by Bronnie Ware. And at the top of the list there was, I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. Today, I will tell you the story of the golden watch, uh, the umbrella, the sleepless night, and the dancing legs. And that's the story of my journey towards taking over the steering wheel in my life. The idea of listening to myself is something that came to me about five years ago, or something like that, when I was having this, you know, quite predictable midlife crisis as I was turning 40. I think some of you have been there as well. Uh, and I started reconsidering my professional life. I was working in academia at the time. And I thought, ah, this idea of having a golden watch after 25 or 30 years of service, that scared me. That's not what I really wanted. My best friend Sarah is 10 days younger than me, and she was having more or less the same feelings. So we decided that we should arrange a party, a birthday party, where we would focus on time and how we use time. So we arranged a party and we had our guests sit down and talk about those things like, what do I really enjoy to do in life? Can I do more of that? What are my strategies for coping with time thieves and then energy thieves and so on? After the party, we felt that, oh, we need to go on talking about these things. So we started a blog, which is still up and running. And here we focus on exactly those things that we talked about in the party. That is, how do we make the best out of life? How do we spot those, all those good things around us? And how do we cope with those days when the sun isn't shining? At that time, a little voice had started whispering inside me, but it would go, grow, grow uh, louder. The next stop on my journey is when I was at the women's festival at a retreat center in Sweden. Um, in this really warm and loving atmosphere of the festival, I felt that it's in context like this one that I would like to spend much more of my time. Uh, to the outside observer, I, I probably had everything. I had a wonderful husband, three great kids, a fourth baby on its way, a lovely house in the countryside, and especially a prestigious job. I was working at university as a senior lecturer doing teaching and research. But inside me, I wasn't really happy. I wasn't happy about my professional life because I felt that I had ended up there without really making active choices. I had entered the teaching profession without really, you know, wanting it. I just ended up there because I didn't know what to do with all my credits in English and French and Swedish. I had also joined a linguistic project mainly because I was flattered. They wanted me, not that I really wanted to be there. And then I had to do a PhD, a Doctor of Philosophy, just to stay on the project. And again, I, was, I wasn't really choosing. Uh, when I finished my PhD, after a few years, I got a permanent position. And of course, I couldn't say no to that. Permanent employment at the university. That's perfect. And of course, there were a lot of good things about my job, a lot of things that I enjoyed, but I never really felt at home in academia. At the festival, uh, at the retreat center, I started really thinking about what I wanted to do, and I wasn't sure at all. I felt that, yes, I would like to be in a climate that is less competitive than the university climate, and I also felt that I wanted more freedom to be creative. So there was this little voice. It had started, it was still soft, but it had started speaking a little bit more loudly to me. Moving now to a very, very hot night in August 2010, uh, quite a lot of things had happened then. I had started working towards an alternative career, but I was still employed by the university. And this night became a really crucial turning point in my life. I lay sleepless. I couldn't sleep at all that night. I lay there tossing and turning in bed, 
crying when the night turned into early morning. And this little soft voice had now turned into a veritable megaphone shouting to me, Maria, you're in the wrong place. Uh, I had to listen to it now. And when I woke up, I told my husband what I was feeling. He could have said like this, oh, are you crazy? Are you going to abandon a promising career just to fulfill your dream? What about us? What about the family? Aren't you, aren't you thinking about the security of the family? But he didn't. He said, OK, if that's how you feel, then you should quit your job and do what's important to you. Thank you very much for that, Anders. Um, and I got that little final push a few days later, days later when I was at the library and I stumbled upon a book uh, that was about a woman who was changing her life. She had been in more or less the same situation as I had been, uh, and she had dared to jump. And I felt, well, if she can do it, I can do it. So, 10 months later, I handed in the key to my office, I said goodbye to my colleagues, and I went home. And I feel, felt so extremely happy. I think I've only been this happy a few other times in my life, when my kids were born and when I got married. Um, and in the night, I was taking a walk in the forest, and I, you know, I couldn't stop my legs from dancing. I was so happy, and I was so relieved. I even had to shout out just with joy, because I was so happy. And it's not that the university was a bad place. It's just that it wasn't the right place for me. And it was time for me now, not time to move on. Today, I earn less money than I've done in my entire life, but I have total freedom to be creative and do exactly what I want to do. I decide now what I want to do. Uh, and I spend basically all my time in contexts where I can grow, where I can develop, and most of what I do is actually about inspiring other people to grow and develop as well. And that's fantastic, I think. It's an enormous opportunity. One problem when you start affirming your creativity is that your brain may go berserk. I think some of you have experienced that. Once you start, you know, listening to your ideas, sometimes it feels like my head is bursting with all those ideas. But I've learned to write everything down and then be patient because I've realized that I don't have to fulfill all my dreams at once. I don't even have to fulfill all my dreams at all. The, the very idea that I can do basically anything is enough. It makes me feel so rich because there are so many opportunities. And I've also realized that meditation and yoga are quite good remedies for this inspirational overload, as I like to call it. You often hear about informational overload, but I've um, more of inspirational overload sometimes. When you're standing there at the cliff edge, you're ready to jump, you're trying to trust your gut feeling, although you're really, really scared, very often you would like some kind of guarantees, right? You would like to move a few years ahead in time and look back on yourself and say to yourself, yes, yes, you did exactly the right thing, that was the perfect decision, everything went all right. Uh, it's the same thing when we meet somebody and enters, enter a new relationship, isn't it? We want to know, this is Mr. Right or Ms. Right. Uh, but there are no such guarantees, I'm sorry. So sometimes there are days when I worry, when I panic, what have I done? But most of the time I'm in this creative flow and then I think I'm doing exactly the right thing. I've also learned to trust an idea that everything that I really need will come to me when I'm ready. And that's quite useful. There are some things that have helped me on my journey. And they are all about digging where you stand to actually use the inspiration and support that's there all around you. One of these things is family and friends. I've had a lot of support and inspiration from my family and and friends. First of all, the approval of my husband, of course. And then a lot of support from friends have told me, you're so brave doing this, and that's really, really helpful. One of my greatest sources of inspiration is my daughter, who's here today, and we have several creative projects together. That's wonderful, I think. Another thing is the circle way. It's a way of talking together in a group. One at a time, you use a talking stick or stone, just like Native American Indians, uh, if you've seen these tribe and, um, meetings and so on. One person at a time speaks and all the others listen attentively without interrupting. This is a very good way of learning to listen to your inner voice, uh, to find answers inside you. And you can also be inspired by listen, listening to other people. 
This is something I use both privately with my family and some friends, and I also use it professionally when I lead groups. And it's very useful, I think. Um, <clears throat> another thing that I've found useful is social media. I have written quite a lot about my process in my blogs on Facebook, and it's been a way for me to verbalize where I'm going, where I am now, where am I going, and so on. And I've also got a lot of good response that way, so that has also been very, very helpful. <clears throat> Inspirational lunch guests. This is something I do together with a couple of friends. We invite people that we're curious of, and we ask them to tell us their life stories. It's a very simple and it's a very cheap way, but it's extremely amazing. You can hear so much. It's just like a TED talk over lunch. It costs you a lunch. And it has been a very great source of inspiration for all of us, I think. Books. Magazines, radio, TV, I like to read about and listen to people with inspirational stories. Um, and there are so many things you can learn from that and that can help me develop my ideas. And finally, I use some techniques from mental training, you know, things that are often used in sports, like affirmation and visualization. So I've used, for instance, affirmation as a way of formulating sentences of visions, things that I want to come true, as if they had already been realized. I can do this in a book or just in my head when I'm taking a walk or meditating. And it's, it's a good way of, again, verbalizing your ideas. And visualization is about creating an image of what you want to happen in your head or on paper. That has also been very useful. So all these things have been tools on my journey, and they are all about digging where you stand rather than taking a lot of realize your potential courses. You can do that as well, but I think there are a lot of things just around us that we can use. What I hope I have conveyed to you now is summarized quite well, I think, in a quote from a film, Australia. Perhaps you've seen it, some of you. I didn't like the film very much. I think it was too much Hollywood. But there is one thing I remember, and it's this quote. Most people like to own things, you know, land, luggage, other people. Makes them feel secure, but all that can be taken away. In the end, the only thing you really own is your story. And if you consider this, I think it becomes quite important to make your life a good story, or at least as good a story as possible. There are, of course, people who disagree with my ideas on story making. There's nothing I can do, you know, assuming the role of the victim. That's a very popular reaction. And it's sometimes I quite often meet uh, in groups where people come together, for instance, to talk about stress and their working lives. There's nothing I can do. Everything is about structural problems, bad resources and so on. But I've come to learn that everybody can do something. It doesn't mean that you have to accept a lot of lousy working conditions, but there is always something you can do to feel better. That's easy for you to say. You haven't been through what I've been through. That's also a, a reaction to this idea of story making. Uh, and I think some people tend to believe that people who have fulfilled their dreams, they have just gone through life without any hardships at all. But that's not the case. I've had a lot of hardships in my life. I've been through mobbing and cancer and uh, near burnout and a lot of other things. And I think that I've learned a lot from these experiences. They have taught me to really value life and to to uh, use, use it as well as possible, okay? Another reaction is, everybody can't be a writer or pop star or famous chef. No, of course not. And I don't think that's everybody's dream either. What I want to say to you today is that we can all learn to navigate more according to our internal compasses, to listen more to our inner voices, to what we really want to do. And it can be about anything from job situations, to leaving a destructive relationship, to starting a new hobby, or about where you want to live, in the countryside, in the town, and so on. It's about listening to yourself and respecting your own feelings. And finally, all this ego stuff. Is it all about making feeling good and thinking about yourself? Isn't that very selfish? Well, I strongly believe that people who feel good also do good do good for other people. When I'm not satisfied with my life, I have so little energy to care about anything but myself. But 
when I feel better, I care more about other people, about society, about the environment, because I have the energy to do that. So, living a life true to yourself and not a life that other people expect of you, and using what's there around you, sources of inspiration and support. That's the idea that I wanted to bring to you today. And that's also an important lesson that I would like to, to teach my children. I would like to end with a talk, uh, with a quote, uh, which I think sums this up fairly well. We've all been placed on this earth to discover our own path, and we will never be happy if we live someone else's idea of life. James and Prague. The other day, I think I got some kind of acknowledgement when my eight-year-old daughter said to me, Mommy, I would like to be like you when I'm 44, because you seem to have such a great life. Thanks for your attention.